today's movie is Hereditary, the 2018 horror film written and directed by Ari Aster. The film stars Tony Collette, Gabriel Byrne, Alex Wolfe, Millie Shapiro and Anne Dowd. After the death of her elderly mother Ellen, troubled artist Annie finds her home and family perturbed by strange events. When a tragic accident befalls Annie and Steve's young daughter Charlie, the family begins to unravel and ominous secrets about Ellen's past begins to surface. What black magic cult was Ellen involved with and what dark legacy has Annie's family inherited? I first saw Hereditary in the cinema when it came out and I was just blown away by what an original and thought-provoking film this was. I love its ambiguities and the number of questions it leaves the viewer with and it certainly left me with a lot of questions. While Hereditary is a really original film, it does evoke comparisons with some other interesting horror films, uh, notably Rosemary's Baby, and perhaps most interestingly, Nicholas Rogue's 1971 horror masterpiece Don't Look Now. Don't Look Now and Hereditary both concern themselves with grief and the loss of a child, but what they also concern themselves with is a protagonist who is psychic, who does not realise they're psychic, and who is refusing to see all the signs around them of the danger that lies ahead. Hereditary signals this theme early on with the classroom scene where the teacher is talking about Heracles' flaw being that he doesn't see the signs around him about the inescapable fate that is ahead for him. And while this is happening, uh, Annie and Steve's son Peter is not listening but is just looking at the bottom of the girl in front of him. Hereditary is a film that is filled with signs. The writing is literally on the wall in the form of the necromancy words that are written in Annie's home. She sees them but does not acknowledge them. Who has written the words there? Is it Annie's mother? Is it Charlie? Is it somebody else? The most obvious act of denial and of not seeing in the film is when Charlie is decapitated in the accident and Peter acts like nothing has happened. He sort of just pretends it hasn't happened. He goes home in shock and goes to bed. But there are so many other instances in this film of people just refusing to see what is in front of them. And so it is with Annie, who can't see her mother's necromancy sigil for what it is. She can't see the ritual triangle her mother has burned into the floorboards for what it is. Um, equally, she doesn't see the suicide note that her brother left wherein he mentions that his mother was trying to put people into his body uh, for the truth that it is. But most of all, she can't see or won't see that her daughter is at least partly inhabited by the demon Paimon that her mother's cult is trying so fixedly to incarnate into a human form. However, on some level, she knows something. She knows something is wrong. She's made a model of her mother in a very disturbing scene, trying to breastfeed the baby Charlie. And this model, she turns towards the wall so she doesn't have to look at it. And even on the model of Charlie's room, she has actually written the necromancy word onto the wallpaper of the model. But she just cannot acknowledge it because it is too horrible. And what is interesting to me in the film is that this hidden or repressed knowledge does come out through her art, but also comes out when she's asleep, in her sleepwalking, in her dreams. I think most tellingly in the sleepwalking incident where she tried to um, set her children on fire, and in which she actually says to them, uh, I'm not trying to hurt you, I'm trying to protect you. On some level, she knows what fate the cult has in store for them all, and she is trying to protect them by killing them. Um, equally, in another dream, she reveals to Peter that she never wanted children and her mother pressured her to have a child, to have children, presumably um, to provide more hosts for her endeavours to incarnate the demon Paimon. Annie even says that she tried um, to induce a miscarriage, but it just didn't work. Annie mentions that she has trouble sleeping and she's so disturbed by what happens when she's asleep because this is when the repressed knowledge bubbles up to the surface. Ultimately, and too late, what Annie comes to realise 
is that she and her family are the subjects of a long-term intergenerational magical working by the cult to incarnate the god Paimon. This is what her mother Ellen tried to do with her own son who committed suicide to escape her and it is what she has succeeded in doing with Annie's daughter Charlie, even though Charlie, being a girl, is not the ideal host for Paimon. The embroidered mat with the name of Charles on it that Annie finds among Ellen's possessions I think is the indicator that Ellen was hoping that her daughter would have another boy for her to try and work the incarnation on, but she had to make do with the girl. As Annie explains at one point, she and her mother were estranged while Peter was a baby. So my main question about Hereditary is this. Is Annie's husband, Steve, involved in the plot? Is he involved in the cult? When I first saw this film at the movies, at the end, that was the main question in my, in my mind. Was Steve involved? And I've asked various people who've seen the movie if they share this uh, view, this suspicion, but no one seems to. So I would like to lay out my case as to why I think Steve might be in on it all. Steve is a very enigmatic presence throughout the whole film. He's so unemotional, he gives so little away. Is he a red herring or is he involved? Red flag number one for me is when uh, the cemetery calls the house to let the family know that Ellen's grave has been desecrated and her body has been stolen. It's Steve who answers the phone and when he is told this incredibly disturbing news, he does not react. What he says to the man on the phone is, it's only been a week. Not, what the hell? Are you saying that my mother-in-law's body has been stolen? Have you called the police? He does not react to the event, merely the timing. And then he lies to his wife and doesn't tell her that this has happened. He makes up some excuse about the billing. Afterwards, when the cemetery sends Steve photos of the disturbed grave, the empty grave, uh, he has no reaction to seeing the photos. It is the most minimal of reactions, and it's not one of horror or shock. He just looks mildly concerned. When Annie finds the door of her mother's room has been opened, she asks Steve if he's been in there, and he denies it, even though he's the only one at home. Annie goes to a grief support group in secret. She lies to Steve about where she's going. Even though Steve is actually a psychiatrist, she cannot talk to him about her grief or her emotions. She doesn't trust him and they are emotionally distant. After Charlie's death, we see Steve in Charlie's room looking through her sketchbook. He looks at the page with the image of the decapitated bird's head wearing a crown and once again, he does not react. All he does is clutch the book to his chest. Also, after Charlie's death, Annie can no longer stand to have Steve even touch her. She can't sleep in the same room with him or even the same house. Does she on some level know that Steve is perhaps involved? The only time we see Steve actually showing any emotion is in the car when he is bringing uh, Peter home from school after Peter has bashed his face into the desk because he's become possessed. He stops at the lights and uh, begins to weep. Is he weeping at this point because he realizes that his son is possessed and the final stage of the magical working is underway and he knows that it will involve the sacrifice of his one remaining child and the sacrifice of his own life. If Steve was a part of this plot from the beginning, if he was set up to marry Annie and to have the children for the cult, it doesn't mean that he doesn't love his children even while knowing what the cult has planned for them. There could be ambivalence there about both wanting and not wanting this um, incarnation to happen because it does mean he would lose his children and his own life. This ambivalence might explain why it was uh, Steve who urged Annie to not have any contact with her mother when Peter was born. But by the time that uh, Charlie is on the way, he might have been brought back into the fold of the cult. If his black magic practicing mother-in-law was there from the start, from Charlie's birth, um, using his baby as a host for this demon, 
Are we really to believe that a psychiatrist didn't notice anything amiss in this relationship or in his mother-in-law's effect on his child? Or was he aware of it and okay with it? The signs are all around him that something is very wrong. The signs are on the walls of his house, on the floor, they're in the black magic activities of his mother-in-law, in the very strange behaviour of his daughter. Yet he doesn't notice any of this. He's a psychiatrist and he doesn't sense that anything is wrong. He just stands back and watches it all. Does that make sense? As a psychiatrist, he is weirdly passive and uninvolved while his wife goes through emotional hell and while his son suffers severe mental anguish and trauma. He just seems to sit there watching it all and doing nothing. I find that odd in a psychiatrist. I find it doubly odd in a father and a husband. Even when Annie tells Steve that she's found a body in the attic, he just doesn't react, even though he is the first one who notices the terrible smell in the house. Now, this is the point in the film where I think it starts to all get a little bit too real for him and he begins to hesitate about going ahead with the plan. If he is involved, he knows that at this point, if he goes forward, there is no turning back. When he comes down from the attic after seeing the body, he actually accuses Annie of having stolen the body uh, when she was going out to her grief counselling meetings and she told him she was going to the movies. He suggests that she was really going out and stealing the body, which doesn't really make sense given that she doesn't uh, come home covered in dirt. So is he just stalling here in a moment of panic? It's at this point he reveals that when the cemetery called, he didn't tell Annie that the body had been stolen because he didn't want to worry her. Now, does this make sense to you? Because I find it very odd. Um, I can understand not mentioning to someone that you'd perhaps, you know, put a dent in their car because you didn't want to worry them. But the fact that her mother's grave has been dug up and the body stolen, to not mention that just does not make sense to me unless he is covering something up. So... Is the biggest thing that Annie can't see, because it is just too horrific, the fact that her husband is in on the plot to use her family to incarnate the demon Paimon. He refuses to throw the book in the fire at the end because it is not the way things have to play out in order for the plan to work. We see throughout the film that the family is being watched, watched and manipulated, just like the little miniature dolls in Annie's miniature houses. Someone is seen breathing outside the window when uh, Peter gets invited to the party where Charlie will be killed. Someone puts a leaflet inviting them to a seance through their letterbox. When we see the big reveal shot of Joan in her apartment towards the end, we see that she has on her table items from Charlie's bedroom and even the decapitated bird head that Charlie kept in her pocket. So how did Joan get these things? The family lives way out in the woods. Are cult members camping out in the woods around their house or do they have someone inside the house working for them? How else would the cult know that Peter was going to attend the party and arrange the accident that would happen on his way back? Now, maybe there are other explanations for the father's behaviour in this film. Um, I don't know, you might have a different view of hereditary than I do. But having seen it now about four times, I'm still not comfortable with his role in proceedings and I still think he is up to something. I'll leave you with one final thought. Um, in another video, I talked about the relationship I saw between the 1971 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory and Ari Aster's follow-up to Hereditary Midsummer. Now, it may be drawing a long bow here, but I do see some similarities between Willy Wonka and Hereditary. We have a small group of people who've been chosen as part of a plan where there's a prize at the end, which is the golden riches, which will be given to the sorcerer. Um, Willy Wonka is perhaps a sorcerer type figure also. Events are being manipulated and one by one each character is picked off and at the very end the one that comes through makes it to the final destination is a plucky young kid named Charlie. Charlie.
you're all right now. You are Paimon, one of the eight kings of hell. Thank you so much for watching my uh, rambling thoughts about hereditary today. And I hope I will see you next time. Bye.